Hey gamers, what's up? I bid you welcome. So in previous video I mentioned that I'm gonna make an Atari 2600 game. You might ask why? What's the point of making something on such an old platform? Well, so I could put the game on my DIY cottage and flex. Look, this is a cottage that I made. Look at it! And it even has my own game on it. Like, how cool is that? But seriously, there are two reasons why I'm doing this. First one is that I just want to exercise my brain by learning something new and challenge. The reason too was just that I wanted to make some kind of little fun game, but I wasn't sure what to make. You see, with the modern computing today, the sky is the limit. So the possibilities might overwhelm you. It might be very hard to decide what kind of game you want to make. You might even try to develop something that's beyond your capabilities by trying to mimic modern AAA games. As I've heard, the 2600 has many limitations and the limitations might force you to think out of the box and come up with something unique and fun or maybe not so fun. <laughs> Plus, you can make a really ugly looking game but nobody will be able to criticize you since the game is running on 2600. So what makes a good Atari 2600 game? With all the games that I love to play today on this platform, I've noticed a pattern of things that make a game enjoyable. So basically there are two main things. The first one, the game should not rely on any manuals. I mean, the manuals are good and all, but if it's necessary to read that manual, that's, that's not a good idea. There are quite a lot of good games on the 2600, but you will never know they are good unless you read the manual and know how to play that game. The best example is E.T. It's not as bad as people say, but I don't think you will be able to figure it out by yourself. Or for instance, well, let's take pressure cooker. It might seem cool at first, but you will never master it unless you read the manual and know you can actually deflect those ingredients that fly and get you and avoid penalty points. I mean, it should be that hard to figure out a tire game. You just have a, a stick with four directions and one button, just one. But believe me, some people try to make this process much harder than it should be, especially by using switches on the console as additional buttons in the game. Like, Come on, well, I get it, they, they try to cram their complex simulation games into the console that, that is meant to play Pong. The second thing is the fine tweaked challenge. As we know, easy games are boring, but the insane difficulty is also not so great. The game should let you reach the end of the goal and then defeat you, but somehow it should let you think that you can beat it with another try, but you never will. Well, at least in the first 100 attempts. The game should put some pressure on you so you would never relax. This pressure could be implemented as just as a simple time, maybe fuel or oxygen that is running out, maybe some hordes of enemies or space rocks that are coming at you. The problem with all this is that it's like super hard to just pick the just right difficulty and the level of challenge and tweak it all. Especially, especially if you're a noob like me. So I wanted to make something exploratory, like roguelike. Something where you can explore and discover stuff. The problem, as I've heard, the 2600 has very little amount of memory. So placing a huge randomly generated map is nearly impossible. What about a simple digging game where you just dig the ground I might discover some, some cool things. Maybe I could add some falling boulders to it as a hazard. Perhaps the map could be really small. I figured it's a good idea to make a prototype first with something you know how to work with. Heck, it could be even pieces of cardboard. The prototype should not be perfect and the main goal of it is to find out if your game idea is good enough and perhaps there could be some improvements made to it. So I started to make my prototype of the digging game on PC with C++ using my OpenGL engine. Yeah, I know, like, 
if you're a beginner, probably that's not the greatest choice, but it's, it was easy for me. And I managed to make something working in a half of a day. At that moment, I had a very rough idea what the 2600 can do. So I tried to design my prototype so that there would be no fancy 3D perspectives, no scrolling, no semi-transparent objects or object rotations. And I had in mind that I must limit my memory use. So that means no huge randomly generated maps or tons of parameters that could be customized. I made a 13 on 7 map. You need to reach the bottom of the level by digging the ground. You only can dig in horizontal directions. To go down you need to reach a ladder. Once you descend it down, you can't go up. When you reach the bottom right corner of the map, you will find an exit and the game will start all over. Well, that's kind of boring. We need to add some pressure. How about some flowing lava that could chase you? Remember that Flintstones level on NES? Oh yeah. I also added some boulders that you might find while digging the ground. They aren't falling, but they might prolong your digging and let the lava catch up to you. All right, that's, I'd say, is almost good enough. So let's spot the game on the Atari 2600. So let's get familiar with the hardware first. There are three main chips. The most important is of course the CPU 6507, which is a variation of 6502 processor. As you might know, this processor was used in the NES. Unfortunately, the 2600 uses a cheaper and limited version of it. The second one is a Riot chip. Riot stands for RAM, input, output and timers. So this chip does exactly that and it contains 128 bytes of RAM. The last but not least is the TIA chip, which draws all the pretty colors on the screen but apparently has no video memory. The biggest disadvantage of 2600's CPU is that it can address only with 13 bits. That means it only can access 8 kilobytes of memory. So how the console uses this memory? As you see there are three 128 byte chunks. Two of them goes to Riot and TIA registers. And one is left for us as RAM. As for the ROM, the CPU can only access 4 kilobytes. That's the reason why there are all these clever ways developed to make bigger than 4 kilobytes cartridges work. Like this bank switching and stuff. I don't think I will have any problem with the ROM size since my game is pretty simple. But the RAM can be a problem. Let's say my map is made of 13 on 7 cells. Each cell is 1 byte, so in total I have 91 bytes. That's almost all the 2600's RAM, so we have only 37 bytes left. Since I wrote my code with C++, I guess the code might, might kind of make sense to you, even if you don't code. But in order to make it work efficiently on the 2600, we have to make it more weird and alien. We have to rewrite it in assembly language. This kind of programming language is close to machine code as it gets, so it becomes less comprehensible to normal humans. The short words here are the CPU instructions. The program that creates the machine code, also known as the assembler, simply needs to convert each of these words into a particular number. And then, when the CPU will see that number, it will know exactly what to do. So by using this language, we are directly talking to a CPU here. It's a bit different with high-level languages as C++, since they have compilers that convert uh, your fancy statements, no matter how short they might seem, into hundreds, maybe thousands of assembly instructions. And only then those instructions could be assembled into the machine code. That usually makes a bloated and inefficient code. And the games that are written this way will be very slow on old systems like Atari 2600. So technically we could write our game in, in C, heck maybe even in basic, but most likely that would be a not very great idea. So to get started we need some tools. The most important is DASM. 
At least that's what I'm using now. You can get it for every operating system of your choice. Now I need to test my game somehow. But I don't want to write an EEPROM every time I change something. So I'm gonna use an emulator. Currently the best emulator for the 2600 is Stella. It also could be used to debug the code. And of course I will need some text editor to write the code with. But it doesn't matter that much. So we are going to write some 6502 assembly code. If you are familiar with the x86 assembler or even uh, the assembler on Z80, the 6502 assembly might look a, a bit odd to you. The 2600 CPU has three registers. The accumulator A and two index registers X and Y. There are no floating point numbers and you can't specify numbers like 0.5 or divide 5 by 2. Heck, you can't even divide or multiply at all. There are only simple math operations like addition and subtraction available by default. We are going to communicate with the hardware using reads and writes to a particular memory addresses. The CPU registers will be used for this task since we can't directly write to a memory address. First, we need to load the byte into a CPU register and then we can store the contents of this register to, to a memory address. So I somehow managed to set up my tools and get going. I found out that in order to compile my assembly code, I had to copy VCSH and MacroH headers to my working directory. I also made a small shell script to execute DASM in order to assemble the binary from my code. By reading the TIA documentation and various tutorials online, I found out that the 2600's hardware is designed to make specific types of games, especially like the ones the system was shipped with. So it has some annoying constructs like this background, some kind of playfield obstacles, the limited amount of sprites, like one sprite for each player. The most shocking thing to me was there is no video memory at all. The TIA chip has some registers of several bytes, but they are not that very helpful. There is no way to draw pixels on the XY coordinates. In order to draw something on the screen, you have to literally raise the electron beam of your CRT TV. And yes, the 2600 is designed to have like CRTs in mind because it's like 70s, what, what, what do you expect? You have to keep track of every line that is being drawn by the beam and you have to know exact timings of the beam and where it will be located at certain moments and your code must follow those timings. If your code executes longer than it's supposed to then well you won't draw anything on the screen. So there is this background construct in the TIA. It lets you draw some pretty static image on the screen. As I mentioned, you can't change it pixel by pixel. You have to play with the beam. The easiest thing to draw with it is lines. Simply set the color luminance background to color of your liking and then tell the TIA to wait for the end of the scan line. So as my first attempt I drew this rainbow lines on the screen. I iterated through 192 lines and incremented the color value for each one. The playfield thing is weird. You only can change it by changing bits in three playfield byte registers during a scan line. That will change 20 segments on the left of the screen. By default those segments are duplicated on the right. But if you want to create some sort of pattern that's asymmetrical, you need to start hacking and change the contents of the playfield registers in the middle of scanline. When the left half of the scanline is already drawn on the screen, so you must be very precise with the timing or it won't work. In my case it did not, so I just drew some black bars for now. Now ok, sprites, player 1, player 2, ball, missile 1, missile 2 and that's it. So those are supposed to be the 2600's hardware sprites. Apparently the TIA chip can only store one line of pixels for the sprite. So in order to draw something that makes sense, you must update that line every other scan line. 
Most of my time with this project was spent on attempts to draw my game character sprite. At first I just managed to draw this grey column by just storing some bits into the player 1's graphics register. Then I figured out you can check the scan lines number and start and finish drawing the sprite from the particular lines. So this way I got some sort of rectangle and I could finally specify Y coordinate. And yeah, you can just simply specify X and Y coordinates for the sprites. Then I tried to define 8 lines of my sprite in ROM and try to load each of them into the player 1 graphics register exactly when the electron beam was moving through the scan lines I needed. And boom, I was able to draw my character. The next task was to control the character with a joystick, even though at the moment I could only change the Y coordinate of the sprite. So I tried to read Riot's joystick's register and by pushing bits to the left I could easily find out in what direction the joystick stick was moved. This way I could finally control my character. But how do I move it on the X axis? Apparently that's a pretty complicated task. You have to waste some particular number of CPU cycles during the blank period and activate some special registers and only then your character will be able to move left and right. I'm not fully understand how it works yet. I was pretty happy with my progress so far so I transferred my experiment to the EEPROM and tried on the real hardware. Well, it looked kind of different from the emulator. Since now I finally have my character, I will need to use the playfield for the map. I guess it's gonna be fine for the dirt and, and lava, but how the heck I'm gonna draw ladders? Will I be able to draw ladders at all? Will my game finally become playable? You will find out this on the next episode of Programmer Ball Super. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you like this new experimental programmer's vlog video. If you did, please hit that like button. Also, I created a git repository on GitHub for my game. So you can check out the code and mess around with it if you want. The link is in the description. So that's it for now. See you next time. Bye.